Hallelujah. Man, what a powerful time of worship. Amen. Woo. Hallelujah. Some of the oldie but goodie songs. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, this morning is really going to be a treat not only for you, but it's probably going to be a treat for me. The Lord changed my message on me this morning. And, uh, but there's a reason for it. There's a lot going on on the inside of what God's doing. There, um, this morning, we're, we're going to actually, um, we're going to be talking, we're actually going to be starting a train of thought. Most of you know that I like to teach in series. I like to do things in series. And, and the Lord spoke to me about keeping every series that we do this year based upon trusting God. And the reason is, is because in, in the years of ministry, the things that I've seen, there's a lot of people, uh, and, and don't, don't, don't get upset with me when I say this, but there's many individuals that I truly believe that they believe they trust God. I, really, I, I believe that they believe they trust God. But when we, when we compare our actions, when we compare our actions to what the Word of God says, the reality is, is we don't trust God. That's the reality. We want to believe that we trust God. We want to believe that we put Him first in everything in our life. But when we begin to compare our life, not with each other, but when we compare our life to what the Word of God says, we come to a realization that we really are not trusting God the way we should really be trusting God. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so this morning, I'm going to launch a series of messages and I, you know, I, God has just been all over me this week, last week, and, and He's just really bringing some things to my, my thought process, my memory, and, and, and what He's wanting me to speak. And some of these are very fundamental, they're very basic messages, but I think sometimes we just need to get back to the basics. basics. Can somebody say amen? amen? And so this morning, the title of the message is, Who Are You? Now we're going to be now. These are this is a very common message. It's a very if you've been in church for any length of time, you're probably going to hear a lot of uh, a, a lot of repeat or however you want to say it. But there's something that I believe that we don't need to just read the word. We don't need to just glaze over the word. We need to really dive into the word. And sometimes I feel that we can kind of glaze over things and we don't really get the meat out of what's being said. And so this morning, the only way I could title this this morning would be to title it in saying, Who are you? And so we're going to begin in Ephesians. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's take a look at Ephesians. I handed uh, two sheets of, of, of sermon today to the soundboard, and, and I, I, I told them we won't get through all this today. <laughs> I said, but uh, whatever you can put up on the screen, put up on the screen. And uh, so we'll try to have the scripture up for you if, if, if it doesn't get up there. Uh, in, in time, blame me, it's my fault, don't, don't blame the soundboard, amen? So let's take a look at Ephesians, and we're going to start with, first of all, with Ephesians 1, and I'm going to read a portion of scripture to you here this morning, Ephesians chapter 1, and, and I want you to just listen to what it's saying, and, and, and I want you to really just kind of focus in, if you need to, close your eyes, however you want to do it, but Paul opens up with a prayer here, and he's praying for the Ephesian people. Now, and, 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 and I want us to dissect this prayer and how he prays. Let me, let me put it to you this way. If we could all pray like Paul prayed, we'd be better off. Yeah. I'm just saying. All right? And so let's take a look at what he says here. Starting with verse 15. He says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Now this is the New Living Translation, and they might have it in the New King James up there, which is fine. I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. Asking God. Now here's where you really need to pay attention. Asking God. He's asking God to do a few things here. First of all, he's asking the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give us the spirit of wisdom. Now listen to this. The spirit of wisdom. Insight. So that you might grow in the knowledge of God. Okay. King James Version. That God, Lord Jesus Christ the Father, would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation revelation in the knowledge of him right verse 18 I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope we have given that we've been given to those who are in Christ Jesus who are called 
Watch this. His holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Now the King James says that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. Go to verse 18, if you would please. Verse 18, hallelujah, praise God. I pray that your hearts, watch this, will be flooded with light, right? The New King James says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, right? Okay, so that we could understand the confident hope. There's a lot here, guys. <laughs> There's just so much here. Now, as he keeps reading, the confident hope of those who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Verse 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. His power that he has for those who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Watch this. Seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heavenly realms. Now he is far above all the authority and power or leader. Watch this. Or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Not only in this world, but in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. For the benefit of who? For the benefit of the church. Who is the church? You're the church. All right. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Now watch verse two, uh, chapter 2 verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Verse 2. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit whose work at the hearts of all uh, those who refuse to obey God. Now, I'm going to keep reading this because I want you to see what's, what's happening here. All of us used to live like that. <laughs> I'm just saying we did. All right? All of us used to live this way. Following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy and He's loved us so much... That even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It is only by God's grace that we've been saved. For He has raised us... Now here's the pivotal scripture, verse 6. For He has raised us... Say, I, I have, have been raised. He has raised us up from the dead along with Christ. Watch this. And seated us. Say, I, I have been seated. With Christ. Okay? Isn't that what the scripture says? Alright, so I've been seated with Christ. Where? In, in the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ. Do you see that? Now, where was Christ seated? Where was he seated? Well, let's go back to chapter 1. What happened in chapter 1, verses 17, asking God, watch this. He goes on to say, uh, actually verse 21. Now he is far above, verse 21, far above what? Any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. If you are seated with Christ in heavenly places, then you are Far above any ruler, any power, any leader, anything else in this world and in the world to come. Now my question to you is who are you? Because if we really believed that, listen to what I'm saying, if we all really believed that, I think we would live just a little bit differently. If we really trusted that scripture above any ruler or authority or power or leader, put that in the New King James if you, if you could please. If we're far above any principality or power, why? Because we are sitting far above any principality, any power, any might, any dominion. And every name that is named 
not only in this age, right here, right now, but also in the age to come. I could stop right there. We could go home and you could meditate on that for a week and still not get everything in it. So here's where I want to go with this. We have been made alive in Christ. We have been seated in heavenly places in Christ. So the first thing I want us to pull out of all this is what does this actually really mean? Well, the first thing we have to look at is John 1.12. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version, John 1.12. And this is what's said in John 1.12. But to as many as did receive, have you received Christ? As many of you that have received and welcomed Him, Christ, He gave the authority. Watch this. He gave what? The authority. This is the Amplified Version. The power, the privilege, and the right to become the children of God. That is, those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely in His name. So if you believe in, trust in, and rely in His name, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you accept Him, He has given you authority, power, privilege, right to become children of God. Who are you? You are a child of God. And we've, we've used that word, well, I'm a child of God, and we've cliched it. We've, it's, it's lost its power. We walk around, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, I'm saved, but you don't live like it. That maybe that's why there's not a lot of people here today. Well, not other than snow. But I want you to really think about this. Do you think kids, kings, live beyond their means? Or beneath their means? Do you think if I'm if, if on this earth, if I'm literally, can you see King Henry, King Harry, what, what's his name, King Harry? Huh, William? King William? Am I, am I getting anywhere close? Is it William? William. Harry? I'm not trying to do anybody disjustice here. I'm just trying to remember their name. Do you think that guy walks around like a pauper in England? Do you think he doesn't know who he is? Do you not think, do you not think he knows what part of family he belongs to? Then if, if, if that's who we are in Christ Jesus, if that who is Jesus has made us to be, then why do we walk around like a dog with our tail between our legs, giving the devil more power in our life than we should ever give him? Why do we live like that? We walk around and we act, look, look, we are a praying church. We are a believing church. Amen? This is what we pray. This is what we believe. Yeah, it makes a few people uncomfortable, but you know what? I'd rather make you uncomfortable and powerful they're not uncomfortable and walking through this life with no power, no authority, no anything and just making life happen to you instead of you making life happen. You need to know who you are. And there's many tactics that the devil uses to come against who you are. Alright? I, I, okay, i got to just go ad lib. None of this is on the scripture, so if you don't make it, that's okay. See, the, what we don't realize is the first thing that the devil tries to do is he tries to get you to question who you are. When Eve was standing in the garden and her husband was standing right with him, what did the devil say? The devil said, well, surely not. God surely didn't say. He get, tried to get her to question who God was. And then he began to get her to question who she was. And a lot of, you don't, a lot of us didn't catch that at first because we look at it and think, well, no, he didn't question who she was. He knew who she was. But now, wait a minute. He did question who she was. She tried to get her to question who she was. Because the tactic that he used was he said, well, if you eat of this tree, you'll have all the knowledge. As if she didn't have all the knowledge anyway. Questioning who she was and what God had given them. And when she saw the tree and saw that it was good and good for food, she ate. If she would have never questioned who she was, if she never would have questioned what God had given her, she would have looked the devil in the face and said, Get out of my face, devil. Am I saying the truth this morning? That's exactly what he does to you. He gets you to question who you are. That's why 2 Timothy says this. He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but he's giving you power, love, and a sound mind. But how many of us walk in fear? All the time. Afraid of everything. We're afraid if a gnat farts and we get it. I mean, I know that's crude, but come on, man. 
We, we're, we're afraid. We're afraid of everything. We're afraid of this. We're afraid of that. Fear comes up on us. Fear is not of God. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. How many of us walk in fear every day? If you're a child of God, you would trust God and you wouldn't walk in fear. How many, how many of us know there's another tactic that the enemy uses? He gets us not only to question who we are, he gets us to question our motives. He gets us to question everything about are you truly saved? Have you truly accepted Christ? Right? He also gets you to question on how good you are. Well, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. Come on now, God has his favorites. And you're not one of them. Well, that's the way the world operates, but that's not the way God operates. He gets you to question some of the acts that you've done. He gets to begin to what? Romans chapter 8, 1. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to what? Spirit. The Spirit of God. If I'm walking according to the Spirit of God, there should be no condemnation on us. It's not that we don't believe God can do it. We don't believe God can do it for us. We believe God will do it, but will He do it for me? Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I spiritual enough? And friend, it does, it, nothing that God has ever done for you, listen, was because you were spiritual enough. What did we just get finished reading in Ephesians? While you were yet sinners, you didn't deserve a thing. While you were dead in your sins, Christ died for you. You've never been worthy. <laughs> Some of you will wake up and get that tomorrow. God's done for you what He did for you, not because of your love for Him, but because of His love for you. So we live be beneath our means as Christians because we don't trust a few things. I'm not going to make it through this message today. I've got so many parts to this sermon. It's going to have to be continued next week. So I'm going to have to leave you like those, those, uh, those four-part series movies, you know, that you watch on <laughs> To be continued. Is that okay? I'm sorry I have to do that, but I can't give you this message in 30 minutes. So please just give me a little leeway here. Is that okay? Yeah. Romans 8, 15, 17 says, For you have not received, watch this, the spirit of slavery <coughs> leading to fear. <laughs> we think we're just caught. We can't do anything about it. I'm in bondage. Listen to what I'm saying. I, th li listen, now I'm going to make this. He says, you have not received again the spirit of fear, watch this, or the spirit of bondage, watch this, that makes you a slaveful, fearful fear. Uh, 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 I like to put the New King James. Forget the New Living Translation. Put up the New King James. I've remembered it in New King James, and I'm trying to read it in the New Living, and it ain't working. <laughs> so, hey, we are not fearful slaves. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. We are not fearful slaves. Okay. For you have received not the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, if heirs of God, and then fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. <laughs> You're a child of God. Not because of what you've done, but because of what He's done. <clears throat> Romans 8.29 says, now this, I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. Romans 8.29, for those... Whom he foreknew. He all knew you before you were ever born. Oh, I'm going to re resist the temptation to go a direction. He knew you in your mother's womb. He knew you before you were formed. Will you just go with that? 
of whom he was also aware, watch this, and loved beforehand. He loved you before you were ever born. You hadn't even had a chance to do anything right or wrong. He knew you before you ever came into this world, and He loved you before you ever came in. For those whom He foreknew, of whom He was aware and loved beforehand. You haven't even taken a breath of air, and He loves you. Man. Hey, stay with me. This love thing is going somewhere. So that means we're children of the living God. Can you imagine not loving your children? Could you imagine not wanting to do good by your children? Now, I know we've got some weird, wacko people out there. I'm not talking about weird, wacko people. I'm talking about the normal human being loves their children. Come on, man. Even the normal animal loves their children. I mean, I was talking to some people that from a previous church, and they're in the cattle business, and right now it's calving season. If those had been in the cattle business, it, 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 yeah. Hard job. But they have to do it in the cold because of the timing of everything and getting to sell and all that. That's just that's another story. But let me put it to you this way. When that baby's calving and it's six degrees outside, they've got to hurry up and get that thing cleaned off because here's what happens. Ice freezes on the calf. And if you don't get that calf somewhere warm where it can at least get its bearings about it and get warmed and get, it, get its blood going, the calf will freeze to death. It'll die. So the rancher has to get in there and get that calf away from that mama. Now you know why you see cat ranchers' trucks with dents in the truck. <laughs> Can somebody that knows what I'm talking about say amen? amen. That mama cat, that mama cow ain't going to just let her calf go. She's going to ram your truck. She's going to ram you. That's just normal human instinct. We take care of our children. Where do you think that instinct came from? It came from your father, God. Amen. He loves you. He cares for you. So what does this mean? Ephesians 2, 4, and 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great what? Love. Love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Look what it says. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I've got to hurry. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 20 says this. He... Christ worked in or he God the Father worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places watch this far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the age to come if we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and he's above all principality and power where do you think you are where do you think you are you're sitting right there next to him. Romans 5.17 says in the Amplified Version, For if because of one man's trespass, lapse or offense, death reigned through that one, we're talking about Adam. Okay, if death came through one man, which was Adam, if death came through one man, Adam, how much more surely will those who receive God's overwhelming grace unmerited favor and the free gift say free, free. gift yeah. the free gift of righteousness putting them into right standing with himself now watch this reigning as kings in life Amen. how many of you feel like you're reigning as a king right now yeah. <laughs> one do you see that scripture? Reigning as kings in life through the one man Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. You can reign in this life as kings through Jesus Christ. 
because of what he's done. Now, I'm not saying that you are king's big K, because there's only one big K king, and that is God the Father. Come on, Jesus Christ, him crucified, right? You're little K. But I'm going to tell you what, even little K king is mightier than anything on this earth. Can somebody say amen? Come on now. I might be a little K king. That's why that king right there is a little K. It's not a big K. We know who we are only in Christ. Hey, it's like having a big brother. Come on now. Jesus is your big brother. It's kind of like Gabe one time. Stand up, Gabe. Come on, I want you up here. He's like, Jesus. That's why I moved away. When Gabe was little, now you see Gabe. Now, now, now Gabe is a big guy. Not just, but he's, he's strong. All right? I'm just saying, isn't he Chrissy? Come on, tell your man how strong he is. Oh, look at that. All right. But when Gabe was little, Gabe had my temperament. Gabe has my temperament. All my children have my temperament. And shut <laughs> Shush! All right. And when he was about this big, he was in our driveway. And these kids that were older than him were coming by on their bicycles and hollering things that, you remember this? <coughs> hollering things at Gabe. Well, Gabe was a pretty big kid to begin with. I mean, he looked bigger than what how his age represented, right? And Gabe, I, I was watching the whole thing. I was in the garage, the garage door was open, but he, it was kind of dark, you know how that dark thing happens, so he kind of looks back and he sees me, but he don't realize I'm watching him, he just sees me. So he sees these kids coming back and they're yelling all kinds of things and he just kind of... <laughs> and man, I'm telling you, this happened, didn't it? It gave, Gabe turns around and he looks at those guys and he goes, You want some? You, you want some of this? And those four kids, how many was there? It was like, there's four on a bike. And Gabe goes, right now. And they start getting off the back. And he looks at me and I, now by this time he sees me coming, right? And Gabe's like, we got this, Dad. Come on. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Now, Gabe not only done that once, he's done it a few times. Am I right? Good job. Thanks, buddy. Even though he's got the size now, even though he's got the size now, as big as he is now, we were going to the park one day, all going to go play Frisbee disc. Not here, obviously. And Evan just jumped out of his car real quick come to a sudden stop, but we were behind him. We didn't know what was going on. Gabe thought it was throwdown time. He thought somebody's doing something to my brother. Man, he's out of that truck. He's in the front, and the only reason Evan was out, so he was helping this person push their car. It died. <laughs> but Gabe was ready to rumble, buddy, and he looked back at me and said, come on, Dad. I'm like, Dad, I'm too old for this, man. There's been times where things have happened and they've known my temperament and I've had to work on things and they've seen it. And Gabe's told me one time, he goes, Dad, it's okay. If you'd have got so mad and got out of the truck, he said, I had your back. <laughs> what am I, what's the point I'm making? The point that I'm making is family has family's back. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The reason we can stand up to that devil is because we look and we've got Jesus standing right next to us. <laughs> right next to us. And we look the devil square in the face and say, you want some? That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a child of God. I am a king's kid. I am a world overcomer. Devil, if it's a fight you want, it's a fight you're going to get. You've already been defeated. I've read the end of the book. We win. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm going to stop looking at my... There's snow on the ground. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> All right. 
For if by this one man's trespass we can now live as kings because of one man's obedience. And who was that one man's obedience? Jesus Christ. He beat the devil down. And some of you know what I'm saying. He beat him down. And Colossians says that he made a public spectacle of him while he was hanging on the cross. Stripped him of his authority. Stripped him of his powers. Took the keys from the kingdom of darkness. Come on now. And Romans make, basically makes this statement that he has translated you, transferred you from the kingdom of darkness and brought you over into the kingdom of light. When you, are, when you are a king's kid, you get lifted up out of the muck and the mire and you get transformed, transformed into the kingdom of God. You are a king's kid. We need to stop living like paupers and we need to start living like kings. Because that is who we are. No longer walking in fear. No, no longer upset. No longer always looking behind our back in fear or, 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 or questioning who we are or questioning our righteousness. We're not good enough. Or questioning anything about us. We don't question who we are because it's not about who we are. It's about who He is. Amen. Colossians 2.10 says, And you are in Him. Say, I, I am, am in Him. Amen. Watch this. Made full. How are you made? Full. You are made full. And having come to what? <laughs> Fullness of life. Do you know what full means? Full means full. Full means full. Which one of these are mine? Full me. Is this full? No. Is this full? No. He said, I will fill your cup full. Is this full? Yeah, look at some of you. I don't know. Is it full? No, it's not full. <laughs> That's not to God. That's not full. This is full. That's full. Overflowing. Why? Why is he wanting full and overflowing? So you can get it all over everybody. It's just water. Don't have a heart attack. It'll dry. This is full. Are you seeing what I'm saying? This is full. He said when you believe in Jesus Christ, rivers of living water will flow out of you. I'm asking you again. Are you living like kings? Are you really living that way? I'm not here to bring any condemnation. I'm not here to get you to question who you are. I'm here asking you, do you feel that you're living up to your full potential in Christ? Do you feel that you are receiving everything that God has for you? See, here's, here's, the, here's the thing that's really come to my attention over the last several years, actually. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. For you can say to this mountain, Be thou removed. Come on now. And cast into the sea. If you what? Believe. Philippians 4, 13. All things are possible to those who believe. Are you with me this morning? Do you really believe who you are? Are you really living like kings? 2 Timothy 1.17 He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Philippians 4.13 I have strength. This is the Amplified Version. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through Him who infuses me, watch this, with inner strength. Inner strength. I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Amen. I'm lacking nothing. Amen. I am complete in Him. So don't let Him come and, 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 and cause you to judge yourself and make you think you're not good enough. I mean, how many's ever fought? Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I haven't accepted Christ. He begins to get you to question, or you do something wrong and you make a mistake. Can I, can I, can I share something with you? I told you this was just... This is just coming out of me this morning. But, but look, look, God's not looking for perfection, friend. 
He's just looking for dedication. He just wants you to be dedicated to who you are. He wants you to be dedicated to who he is. You know, I don't, I'm not perfect, but I can at least make church. Come on, and you, you guys are hearing what I'm saying. You're here today at four degrees. You know what I'm saying. It's all goes on. Never mind. When you know you can come and you don't come. When you know you can read your Bible and you don't read your Bible. When you know you can pray and you don't pray. See, you see what I'm saying. See, we are sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. He's not asking us to be perfect. He's just asking us to be dedicated. Are you dedicated? Are you living on purpose? Are you living on purpose? Amen? And so if we make a mistake, what does that mean? His grace is to empower us not to make the mistake again. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Ephesians. Ch or no, I'm, oh God, I've just got all kinds of scripture going through my head. Which one do you want me to use? <laughs> okay, Hebrews 4.12. That's the one that he wants me to start with right here. Hebrews 4.12. Look what the Word of God says. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Somebody ripped Hebrews right out of my Bible. Hebrews 4.12, look what the Word of God says. For the Word of God is living and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between the joints and the marrow. It exposes, watch this, it exposes what? Our innermost thoughts and desires, right? Right? In most thoughts and desires, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. So what I'm trying to tell you this morning is, is he already knows what he's getting when he gets you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So don't let the devil condemn you. He's come to set you free. You've got power. You've got authority. You've got anointing. It's Jesus Christ in you. Amen? And we can come to the throne of God. And if you keep reading in Ephesians 4.16, look what he says. So let us come boldly. Uh, Hebrews 4.16 Let us come boldly where? To the throne of our gracious God. Watch this. To the throne of our gracious God. How do we come to His throne? Boldly. And what do we do? There we will receive what? Mercy. Why? Because I need mercy. Man, I make mistakes. How many of you make mistakes? How many of you are not perfect? Man, everybody should be raising their hand. That's right. Look at Evan. Evan's like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm perfect. <laughs> Y'all all can raise y'all hand. We're, none of us are perfect. Look what he says. So we first, what do we get when we go to the God's throne boldly? What's the first thing we get? Mercy. That's what we need. Right? And there we will receive what? His mercy. Watch this. And we will find grace. There's that grace. Say, thank God for grace. Look what he says. To help us in time of need. Mercy forgives you. Grace helps you. That's why he's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for dedication. That's why in 1 John 1, chapter 2, he says, I would that you not sin. My dear children, 1 John, chapter 2, My dear children, I'm writing this to you that you will not sin. But, say but. But, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. Who is that advocate? Jesus Christ. He's not looking for perfection, friend. He's just looking for dedication. Are you dedicated? Do you know who you are? So I'm going to close with this. I'm coming, I, I've got to wrap this up. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe this? Now I want to show you what the problem is. And it's not with God, obviously. It's with us. And here's, let me, let me show you one scripture, a few scriptures here. See, I don't think we've been taught what it means to really believe. We really haven't been taught what it means to believe. There are actually two types of belief, and this is the part that I can't get into. We're going to get into this next week. But there's two types of belief. There is an intellectual belief, and there's a heart belief. Okay, And heart belief is totally different than intellectual belief. And so let's take a look at Scripture. How are we supposed to believe in Christ? How are we supposed to believe in Christ? Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please Him. For those who come to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek Him. What? Diligently seek He's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for 
dedication, who diligently seek Him. Do you see that? Now watch this. Romans 10, 9, the most famous scripture, the Romans' road to salvation. Look what he says. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. He says, If you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, in your heart, watch this, and, say and, in your heart. Not head, heart. Not head, heart. If you believe in your heart, adhere to, trust in, and rely on Him. Now see, this is why I like the Amplified Version. Because it tells you what believing in your heart looks like. Believing in your heart looks like adhering to, trusting in, and relying on the truth. That's what it looks like. That God raised Him from the dead. What? You'll be saved. But how do you have to believe? You have to believe what? With your heart. Right? The only way... To truly trust God is to believe Him with your heart. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, You shall love the Lord your God with what? All of your what? Heart. Mark eleven twenty-three. Truly I say to you, whoever says this mountain, look at this. Watch this. Whoever says this mountain, be taken up, cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart heart there's that heart word again amen heart Luke 24 25 says oh foolish man and slow to heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken who's he talking to there he says foolish men he's Jesus was getting a little upset he says man you foolish people he said in the, in the King James Version, in the King James Version, when you look at that, he says, You foolish men and slow of heart. What I feel that's happening is some of us believe that we're saved, right? We believe that we're going to make heaven, but when it comes to reigning as kings, when it comes to believing for healing, health, when it comes to believing for all the things that Jesus Christ has provided to us, we are slow of heart. We're slow of heart. I'm not questioning your salvation this morning. I'm, quite, I'm, I'm wanting you to, to look at who you are and ask yourself a simple question. Am I living up to who God says I am? Or am I slow of heart? Look what he says. He says you're slow of heart. What? To believe in all the prophets that were spoken. Luke 8, 12 says those beside the road are those who have heard the word then the devil comes and takes away the word from their what how does he take the word out of their what they're talking about the seed and the sower where does he take it from he takes it from what her heart he doesn't take it out of their head he takes it out of their heart so many of us are living beneath our means simply because we're not believing with all of our heart John 7, 38, I've already quoted it. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So here's what I'm going to have to leave with you this morning. And I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. I really do, because this is so pivotal. This is so pivotal. Once we believe something with our heart it becomes fixed it's there now I, I want you to hear this because this is this is this is really going somewhere it becomes fixed and it's it's steadfast and no one including ourselves no one can talk us out of it now the downside to this is this happens not only in the good things which is the truth of who God is but it also happens in negative things see people get things fixed in their heart that they believe is true and they believe it and it's negative it's not towards God it's towards this world and towards the sinful nature let me give you an example how about a, a, how about a woman who is in abusive a situation 
husband beating on her, and she will not leave. Because in her heart, she believes there's still love there. Even though I'm getting hurt, even though I'm getting beat, even though I'm getting bruised. See, it was, that, that imprint was made upon their what? Their heart. Okay, how about for those who believe things that just aren't true? Extraterrestrials. Aliens. Man, there's people out there that just have it fixed in their heart that these things are real. Friend, I hate to bust your bubble. They're not real. All of you alien people out there, there are no aliens. There's just a devil that's trying to get your mind off of the living God and get it on something foolish. Because he didn't say, let us make man an alien in our image. He just said, let us make man. There are no aliens. But there are people that literally believe. And man, you try to talk them out of it, and it's like, mm-mm, uh-uh. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So I'm not speaking something that's not understandable here today. We see this happening in the negative realm as well. We see it where people just believe things that aren't true. How about people that believe God is vindictive and mean and they don't want anything to do with Him? That's a belief that they've fixed in their heart. And it's hard to shake them, isn't it? How about atheists? How about people that don't believe in God? You, you, you can go on and on and on and on and on with this. There are things that people have put in their heart. How about the young person who's been told their whole life they're not worth anything? How about the young person who's been told their whole life that they're never going to make anything? They're never going to do anything? They've been, they've, been, they've been told these things over and over. And guess what's happened? It's been what? It's been fixed where? In their heart. Are y'all hearing me this morning? And so this world has told us that we aren't children of God. This world has told us that healing is not for today. This world has told us that there is no power to being a Christian. That all the gifts are done away with. The world has told us all these things. And I'm, I, I hate to say this, church, but a lot of us has bought it. We've bought it hook, line, and sinker. Did you know the drug industry today is a multi-trillion dollar industry? Trillion. You can't watch a TV show without 15 drug commercials coming on the screen. It's just another snake oil. I'm not sitting here telling you to throw all your medicine away. Don't, don't, don't do that. I'm just asking you a simple question. Look at the world we live in. Everything that's happening is trying to tell us there is no God. There is no healing. There is no peace. There is no joy. There is no comfort. Can somebody hear me? Is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? And we've bought it. We have not believed the Word of God. Unfortunately, many people believe the truth of the Gospel intellectually, but they have not been persuaded of the truth by the Spirit with their hearts. And so we have people that are hard of hearts. Their hearts are hard. So how do we fix this? The only thing I can give you this morning is just a, a, a taste of the whistle. Is that okay? You want to be here next week because this very question is answered. Why is it so hard for people to believe who they really are? Why don't we see the miracles? Why don't we see the signs? Why don't we see the wonders that were seen in the early church? Because there's a difference between heart believing and head believing. Heart believing is a result of revelation. What is revelation? The word, the root word of revelation is to be revealed. Revelation means revealed truth. John 8.32 says, You shall know the truth. If you abide in me, you shall know the truth. And the truth what? Will set you free. We need a revelation of who God is until... Now, now one thing we've got to understand something. Let's go back to Ephesians. Where did all this start? All of this started in Ephesians, did it not? We started this message today in Ephesians. So look back at Ephesians chapter 3. Back at Ephesians, and we're, we're coming to a close, but look what Ephesians 3 says. This is why it's so important to read the Word of God, friend. Ephesians 3.19 makes this statement. And this is Paul praying once again. 
I'm going to start with verse 18. He says, And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, watch this, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. Verse 19. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too hard, too great to fully understand. Now watch what He says. But then, say then. Then you will be made complete. You will be made what? Complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You will be full. Then, and the King James says, and now the love of Christ, watch this, and the noble love of Christ, which path is, which, which path, woo, that's King James. My tongue didn't even want to say that. <laughs> now, watch this, look what it says, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, knowledge that ye you might be filled watch this with all say all, all the fullness of God why are people not believing in the fullness of God it's very simple and very easy they don't know how long how wide and how deep God's love is for them that's how and we're going to break this down next week. But the simple answer is this. You don't know how much God loves you. If you knew how much God loves you, you wouldn't walk in fear. If you knew how much God loves you, you wouldn't walk in deceit or questioning or anything like that. If you really knew how much God loved you and how much He had provided for you, you'd be living differently. Can you stand to your feet this morning? Thank you for your patience. So in conclusion... Acts 19.13 says, Then some... Now, I, I just want to show you a little bit of difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge. Okay? And this is what we're going to talk about next week. But here's the thing. You will never grasp how much God loves you. You will never fully grasp what is rightfully yours in the kingdom of God until you understand how much God loves you. So we see in Acts chapter 19.13, it says... Then some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over some evil spirits, and they said, We exorcise you by the name of Jesus, watch this, whom Paul preaches. Y'all remember this story? Seven sons of Sceva. And the demons looked back at them, this is what they said, and they said this, 14, Paul we know. And Jesus we know. But who are you? Paul we know. Jesus we know. But who are you? Jesus is who I am. Jesus Christ in me. I am a child of God. Satan is still trying to get you to question who you are. That's how he worked there, and that's how he's working on you. Don't question who you are. You are a king's kid. And until you get this in your mind, Satan is looking at you and saying, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? And it's when you stand up with confidence and boldness and say, I am a child of God. My name is Rick Beard. And it's written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And if you'd like to take a look at it, I'm sure He will show it to you. That's who I am. Can somebody say amen? amen. That's who I am. That's how I'm going to live. That's how I'm going to breathe. That's how I'm going to walk. That's how I'm going to talk. I'm not going to let the devil beat me from pillar to post anymore. I'm going to walk like a king's kid. How many here is with me this morning? I'm not going to let the devil win. I'm not going to let him tell me I'm, that I'm this or I'm that. I'm going to let the Word of God tell me who I am. I'm going to let Jesus tell me who I am. So this morning, I want to ask you a simple question. How many of you will be honest, honest with yourself, and say, I'm not living like I'm supposed to. I'm lifting my hand. I, I am. Because here's the thing. The devil always wants you to live below your means. And if we live below our means, then people will not... What, then they'll look at us and think, well, well, they don't have anything I really want. 
But let me tell you, when you start laying hands on the sick and they start recovering, when you start casting out devils, when you start taking authority over things, then people, this place would be so packed, we wouldn't have enough room. Because people come where real life is. Where the word of life really is. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that this message today would wake us up. Lord, that we would begin to realize who we really are. What you've really done and the price that you've really paid. That we're not living up to the full potential of what you've called us to do. As the Word of God says, we are to reign as kings. Not only in the life to come, but in this life. Father, help us to fully understand that. And Lord, I pray as each one goes through this week next week, that this message would begin to ring in their ear. And they begin to remember, who are you? Who are you? I'm a king's kid. I've been, a, I've been adopted into the family of God. I'm an heir and a co-heir with Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places above all principality, above all powers, and above every name that's named. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's who I am. Father, I thank you that we begin to, we begin to tell ourselves that every day, every morning we wake up. I am a king's kid. I am a king's kid. I am an heir of God. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God of the living God. This is who I am. And you have given us great and precious promises because of it. Father, we thank you for it. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Can you give them a good praise offering this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here today. Please be careful going home. It looks like the sun is shining. But... Remember those in the bulletin today. Pray for them. Pray that, that, that they receive the healing they need. And go in peace. Be blessed.